Hello and welcome back again to our second, our second catch up I should say, and we're here to talk about all things macarons. So we are going to be inviting our guest, our guest cook Annika Manning um, into our conversation today and she's going to be answering all of your questions that you may have and you maybe have already trialed. So I'm not sure if you've seen her recipe yet on the Winning Appliances website. Um, she has a beautiful recipe for a raspberry and chocolate um, macaron. And I can tell you by testing them, they're delicious. I'm just gonna let Annika join us today. Introduce myself, I'm Chloe. I'm the National Culinary Manager for Winning Appliances. And our guest today is Annika Manning. She's a cook, cook, oh, there she is, author and very talented Hello. lady. Hello. I've got my head a little bit cut off. We're gonna have to adjust it slightly. We'll pull it back a little bit for you so we can. Wonderful. That's, oh, you've got isn't it? Yeah, that's perfect. Good. <laughs> Yeah, I think oh. we can just do without the top of my head so we can see the bench. We got a little bit of both in, which is great. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> how are you, Chloe? I'm wonderful. And how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Just hanging out at home. <laughs> in the kitchen again. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us again for another session. Uh, we've had some wonderful feedback and um, we had some great questions last time regarding all things hot cross buns. And today we're here to get together around your beautiful recipe that hopefully some viewers at home hit the like button, button if you have had a chance to try out her recipe, which was the raspberry and chocolate macarons. So I know these aren't as easy as they seem. Maybe that's why, you know, I think there are a lot of people joining us today and there are some questions around it. So I think we'll get underway and maybe ask the first one, Annika. And, and that one is on the right pronunciation because I think there's a lot yes. of people that say macar macaron, macaroon, and I know there's a difference. So I'm wondering if you can kind of break that down for us. Yeah, so macaron, which is spelt with a one O, um, it's a different type of their, their sort of um, sweet biscuit. So macaron are the French style sweet biscuit that we'll be looking at today. A macaroon is actually an Italian sweet style biscuit. Um, and so they have slightly, they, they actually have very similar ingredients in that they have sugar, um, some sort of nut meal, and then egg whites. But the way that those ingredients are brought together are very different. Um, you could almost say that they are at different ends of the spectrum when it comes to difficulty. Um, Italian macaroons tend to be super simple. Um, they take about 10 minutes to make. They're a little bit more rustic um, than your very classic French style macaron, which tends to be very refined um, and, and very, as we know from Instagram, very photogenic as well. <laughs> Very beautiful, right? Lots of colours, flavours. Yeah, and I, and I should say too, the French style macaron are two sweet biscuits that are or meringue type. They're really, you know, a style of meringue that are sandwiched together with some sort of filling. Sometimes that's a Swiss meringue buttercream. Sometimes it's a straight out American style buttercream with mine. I've sandwiched them with ganache. Um, and so there's various other things. I mean, I, I like to go with the sort of slightly less sweet fillings because the, the shells themselves um, for the French styles macaron are quite sweet. So to have a little bit of contrast in between them is always a good thing. They're hard to stop at one, I know that. Um, yeah. So maybe you can tell us why are they so hard to master? Well, it's, it's one of these recipes that is very much based on the balance of ingredients. So when you're making macarons or French macarons, um, there's two things that are really important. One is measuring and the second thing is timing. There's lots of kind of things that need to fit in with each other as far as the time is concerned. So coming back to the ingredients, as I sort of touched on before, they're based mm. on a nut meal, usually traditionally almond meal. They have egg whites and they have sugar. Um, and what, why they're quite tricky is that the, that balance of ingredients needs to be in 
sink for you to get the right consistency of batter, um, which will then affect the success of your outcome. And we'll go through that today. But generally speaking, you will have equal quantities of a nut meal, equal quantities of icing sugar, and equal quantity, and then the same of caster sugar. Um, and you'll see in my recipe, I've used 100 grams of almond meal, 100 grams of icing sugar that you combine. Um, and then you add egg whites, half of the egg whites to that. And then separately, you make an Italian meringue. And an Italian meringue is when you um, make a sugar syrup to a certain point. This particular one, you bring it to 118 degrees on a thermometer, on a sugar thermometer. And then you add that in a thin, steady stream to egg whites that you're whisking. And so you've, you've got these sort of two mixtures that you then need to bring together. So it's all about how you bring those together. And again, we'll touch on that today. It's also about how you pipe them. So going back to the ingredients, you can see um, I didn't mention egg whites. Egg whites are so important that you actually measure them with scales rather than um, just taking them because more egg whites can throw your moisture balance out. And so more egg white will mean that you'll have um, a more wet, a more moist mixture, which can really affect the outcome. And less egg white can really... Um, again, have equally sort of um, as big of influence on the outcome, but it, it kind of works in reverse. So you can end up with quite a, a, a sort of stiff, dry batter as well. So, and then it's about piping, and then it's about timing them and getting the temperature right in your oven. Um, but as you said, we're going to go through all of that today. So they are, I have to say, they are probably the trickiest of biscuits or meringues mm. to make. But when you know what you're looking for and what you have to be aware of, then it's actually not that hard. Like a lot of things in baking, really. Like you know, we perfect, right? Yeah, we sort of demystified hot cross buns and bread a couple of days ago. So that's exactly what we're going to do here today. Great. That's wonderful. There are obviously a few elements and I'm, I'm, we're very lucky to go through them. So everyone remember to pop your questions in the comments below because we will try to get to all of your, your questions you do have there. So make sure you're typing them in there. Um, and let's get to maybe one of those first topics, which is what should the consistency be like for piping? For your what? Sorry, Chloe? For the piping, for piping. mixture, what consistency are we looking for? Yeah, great. Good question. And I'm just going to show you a few things because the consistency really depends on, again, as I said, the accurate measurement of your ingredients. So more almond meal is going to make it thicker, more egg whites, you're going to add more moisture because egg whites are actually 90% moisture, believe it or not. Um, more sugar, you're going to add more moisture because when sugar dissolves in a mixture, it becomes liquid. Um, so those measurements are incredibly important. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is when you make your meringue, and I've just made this up, what you need to do is make sure that you whisk it enough that it's really beautiful and thick. It's not necessarily going to, actually I'll, pour, I'll hold this over the bowl so it can drip. It's not necessarily going to sort of hold stiff peaks but it's going to be sort of flowing peaks, as you can sort of see here. It's sort of just dropping off that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So with an Italian meringue, it's really important to whisk it until it cools to room temperature. If you stop that whisking process too soon, your meringue will be a lot wetter, and therefore that's going to affect the consistency of your batter. So what I've done here, Chloe, before we get to the meringue, is that mm -hmm. I've actually made... Um, a, a mixture up, and this is all in the recipe, of, this is almond meal, icing sugar, pure icing sugar, and uh, a little bit of food colouring. Now, mm -hmm. the p important thing before you get to this stage is make sure your almond meal and your icing sugar is really well sifted. Because if you don't sift it well and it's still got lumps in it, your macarons won't have all that, that beautiful, smooth, texture on top that we all love and, and it's, it looks really refined and very elegant elegant, and you won't get that if you don't make sure that your icing sugar and almond meal is really fine and well sifted. I sometimes throw mine in the food processor before I sift 
sifted if it's quite lumpy to start with and that will help break it down and make the sifting process so much easier. If there's mm -hmm. bits in your sieve that you can't get through your sieve, um, press as hard as you, can, as you can, but if there's just a tiny bit left, it's okay to discard that, but don't add it to your mixture because it'll just make your mixture lumpy. And then what you do is you measure your um, egg whites. And so we, with this particular recipe with 100 grams of icing sugar, pure icing sugar and 100 grams of almond meal, we add 40 grams of egg whites. So you break three eggs, separate them, whisk the egg whites and then measure 40 grams, which you then add. And you make this beautiful sort of almond paste that's, that's quite soft um, and paste-like. It's sort of a little bit softer than, say, something like um, uh, almond paste that, you know, um, traditional... What's it called? I've forgotten completely. Marzipan. Um, marzipan. Yeah, it's a little bit softer than marzipan. But then what I've done too is that I've added the... Um, I, I've added the food colouring to this mixture mm -hmm. because mixing, and we'll talk a little bit about this a little bit later on, over mixing your um, macaron mixture will actually make it more wet and will loosen it, which can also affect how it bakes. So if you can add your, your food colouring now, um, it's a really great time to add it because then mm -hmm. you've worked it through, it's evenly combined and it's a lot easier then to add your meringue mixture and only gently fold it. Um, the other thing I would say, Chloe, just coming back to the colouring, we've used a Chef Master one, but I always use gel colours when I'm um, colouring my macarons because they tend to be more intense in colour, so you can add less of them, and therefore you're going to be able to maintain that moisture dry ingredients balance more effectively. So you can get beautiful colours um, by using gel colours. So try and get yourself some gel colours. Um, this one's just a baker's rose, what's called a rose mm -hmm. food colouring, and it gives a really beautiful colour, which I'll show at the end. But I've added three drops, but the trick here too, to be able to sort of judge how much to add, I've added three drops, but usually you're looking to add um, enough to give you a shade that is twice as dark as what you want it to be and you oh, might be I don't know whether you can see that but you can see it's got like a little mm -hmm. bit of yellow hue to it and mm -hmm. that's the almond meal that's doing that but by the time you add your meringue which is a bright white color it'll bring that brightness back to the mixture so mm -hmm. it's looking a little bit sort of you know tinted with yellow but don't worry about that at this stage so going back to the consistency Question. We've sort of gone down a few rabbit holes, but I just thought, <laughs> we'll come back. Are we were there? Keep going. <laughs> we can do it. So what we're going to do? We're going to add about two spoonfuls of meringue mixture to this almond mixture. So this is our Italian meringue that we've made mm -hmm. earlier, and we're just going to add about two spoonfuls of that to this. And we're just going to, you don't need to be too sort of careful with this at this stage. What you're trying to do is actually thin this down so it's easier to fold through the rest, which means that that will help you not overwork the mixture. Because as I said, if you overwork the mixture, the mixture becomes too thin and there it can actually cause a, quite a few issues in the long run. So can you see that now that's actually softened down quite a lot? It's not spoonable sort of, you know, it's not dropping from the um, dropping from the spoon yet, but it's still a it's a good consistency that we are now then able to add the rest of this mixture. So now you do that, you add the rest of the meringue. And then I'll show you, once we fold this together, what the consistency should be like before you start piping it. And Ikura, is there a reason we use Italian meringue and not Swiss meringue? Or is there a reason Yeah, so for... you can actually make 
um, macarons using both Swiss or mm -hmm. French or simple meringue. So just to explain that, macarons are probably more likely to be made with Italian meringue because they're more, Italian meringue is the more stable meringue. It's the most stable meringue of all three. Um, you can make macarons using the French style um, meringue, which is egg whites, and then you gradually add the sugar to that. So there's no making a sugar syrup or whatever. But it is the least stable of all three meringues. So what you'll find is that your macarons will be less stable, less predictable, um, mm. and you're going to get a little bit more variation than you would if making Italian. But um, I know I've got a macaron recipe in my um, cookbook, and it's um, it's based on using the French method of meringue, and it you know it's fine. And yeah. but you get a more refined macaron with using the Italian meringue, which is so confusing because you kind of go, well, aren't they French macarons? Shouldn't they use the French meringue method, but they use the Italian meringue method? So it's all a bit confusing. But, um, and then you can actually make them with Swiss meringue as well, which is Swiss meringue is that you put egg whites into a bowl, a heat proof bowl over simmering water. You add your sugar or icing sugar, you stir it till it dissolves and then you bring it to a certain temperature, usually between about 55 and 70 degrees. Um, but again, it's less stable than Italian meringue, more stable than French, but less stable than Italian. So using the Italian meringue here, you're just going to get a more stable, more reliable mixture to then make, which is not a bad thing when you're making macarons. <laughs> exactly. That's wonderful. And sorry. does the gel colouring affect it, Annika? Because we sorry, do have a question. Um, the gel um, uh, powder or will flavouring affect it? So let's say, I know you were talking about the, the colourings and flavourings before. Can we put too much in or yeah, you is there a way that you have to use the gel one, not yeah, just the so ones that we have in the drawer at home? Yeah, I would definitely recommend gel colours because they're more intense. Um, you need to use less of them to get the intensity of colour. And so um, it doesn't throw out that liquid dry ingredients balance that you're so carefully trying to maintain. So, yeah. So once you get to this stage, um, you're using the folding method. So cutting through the mixture, turning the mixture over on itself, and then turning the bowl as you go. But you're being really nice and gentle with it. You don't want to beat it. You don't want to get a wooden spoon out or a whisk. Um, I, I use um, these actually spatulas, which are fantastic. They're actually silicon spatulas, um, as you can see, but they've got a little bit of a bowl in the curve. They're actually called um, spoonulas. And it means that I can uh, scrape the side of the bowl really effectively but then fold at the same time too. So that works really well. So what we're doing is we're working this mixture or folding it gently. The first thing you want to do is get it to a stage where it's evenly combined. So you don't have streakiness in the mixture. You don't have meringue separate from the almond meal, but it's all beautifully combined. Um, and it's all one very... Um, sort of even colour in the mixture as well. The other thing you want to do, Chloe, is get to a stage where it's sort of like, like molten lava, which is kind of a hard thing to know because, you know, who's seen molten lava? Really? the last one the volcano. But it, yeah. just, it, it just needs to be kind of a really kind of smooth, free-flowing mixture that mm -hmm. comes off your spoon easily. So it won't... Um, it won't flow. If it's flowing like a liquid, then it's too wet. Um, if it's not falling from your spoon, then it's, it's, too, um, it's too stiff. Now, there's a really quick mix, uh, mix, quick fix, I should say, uh, for if your mixture is too thick, and that is just to fold it a couple more times and check it again. Because the more mixing, so this is why I was saying that it's really important not to mix too much at the start, is and to be gentle with it because the more you mix the thinner your batter will become and, the, and I, I, yeah and you also not out knock out a lot of the air so mm. there's two things that will happen if you over mix something 
firstly, you won't get those traditional um, feet that you get with a, with a classic macaron, so they won't rise. Um, and they will actually spread so that even if you do get feet, the feet might spread off so they're not a nice little shape that the feet actually do spread out as well. Um, the other thing that happens if your batter's too wet, even when you've piped them out, it's really hard to keep them an even shape. But this bat is looking really good now. So you can see that. It's, um... Yeah, yeah. I understand now when, when you're showing us that even if you were doing orange ones, it would look like lava, right? Yeah. <laughs> or red. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it so, looks... um, so that's that. And now we put it into a piping bag and we can pipe. Do we have any more questions leading up to this stage? I think um, uh, Will was asking it? if, if you're – your meringue does seem to be compromised. Was there a way to save it? I think you have kind of answered that. But what happens in the Italian meringue stage? Is it better for us just to start again? Let's say that we don't get the Italian meringue right because we don't really want to be adding it if we stuff up that first step, right? Yeah, that's right. And I, I would, you're looking for that really thick, glossy texture. Mm. So what can happen with the Italian meringue if you don't bring the sugar syrup to the 118 centigrade point. And say if you add it while it's say 112, your mm. meringue is gonna be quite lax and quite wet. Now, if you add that, then at this stage, obviously your resulting mixture is gonna be quite wet, you know, and flowy, and it's not going to make good macarons. So you are better, I mean, you've got that choice of knowing what to look for and then, okay, is this, where it needs to be and is it the consistency that it needs to be to add. So the, the other thing um, about making Italian meringue, as I mentioned earlier, that is to make sure you whisk it until on high speed until it actually cools to room temperature because a warm Italian meringue still hasn't gained as much volume or mm -hmm. hasn't thickened as much as it has the potential to. So you mm -hmm. want to make sure you whisk it for long enough. It only takes about five minutes. It doesn't take that long with this quantity at all. Um, but what you want to do is make sure that you're getting the, you know, the most volume into it, but also you're thickening it enough that will then help the final texture and consistency of your mixture. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, and we have Cheryl asking, um, what kind of flavouring can be added and when's the best time to add flavourings? Yeah. So flavourings, I find, Cheryl, are best added to the centre. So I've played around quite a lot with um, dried powders and they, I have found, are the best type of flavourings to add. You can add citrus rinds. Um, depending on the acidity level, it's it's a bit um, temperamental because depending on the acidity level of your rind, which can actually vary from season to season and time in the season as well of the citrus season, mm. um, it can actually affect the consistency of your base mixture. Um, it just acid does that, unfortunately. Um, but what I find is having freeze-dried powders, say of raspberry or blueberry or blackberry, um, any of the freeze-dried powders work really well. Don't add a lot, though. Um, and, and as I said before, I quite like to get really punchy flavours in the centre of them that won't affect the consistency and the look and that refinement mm. of the actual shell itself. It's good to maybe put the colouring in. So let's say you want to do a pistachio one, even though you're going to put the, the flavouring into the centre, you may paint it green. So it gives you that aspect that it's not actually the shell that's the yeah. flavour, but the inside that is. Yeah, and, and something with pistachio, obviously you'd be using ground pistachios instead of almonds. Mm. And using your the best, most, the freshest um, sort of nuts you can find that have the most intense flavour is the way to go mm. with macarons because that is really going to shine through your final um, macaron as well. So, you know, if you're using fresh pistachio or, you know, pistachios, make sure that they're, they're as fresh as you possibly can get um, and mm. grind them really finely. Not You don't want to grind them so much they become a paste, but grind them really finely so you get that beautiful texture as well. And you could do the same thing with hazelnuts or... 
absolutely. Nuts. Or walnuts work really well, Brazil nuts, oh, wow. um, any sort of nuts really. So, you know, making hazelnut ones um, with a beautiful um, sort of chocolate ganache centre or something like that mm. work beautifully. I mean, the only thing with hazelnuts, <laughs> it, they do tend to colour the macaron a little bit. Um, so, but it, it, it ends up being a little bit of a speckly kind of pattern, but they're quite cute. Okay. I, I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Wonderful. And Annika, how do we get them all looking the same and uniform? Mine always, yes. I'll have a big one for me, small one for somebody else. You know, how do yes. we get them all even? I know. And then we've got to pair them all up and they're, they're all sort of <laughs> odd. It's <laughs> strange. So what I have done is that you can download on the internet these, you just have to Google macaron template. And what you'll end up with is these templates that are 3.5 centimetre um, circles. You print them off and you place those under your baking paper on your tray, on your baking tray. I'll show you how to do this. And then all you have to do is pipe into them. Can you Perfect. see those? Yeah. And so you all end up. The other thing you can do if you don't want to do that is just get a 3.5 cutter. Use a pencil on... Um, on your baking paper, mm -hmm. put them, draw them on your baking paper, turn your baking paper over though, because yeah. you don't want lead or pen marks on the bottom of your macarons, which is, you know, a lot of people actually end up doing because they don't think about that, but they will mark the bottom yeah. of them. So that's, that's the way. And then the other thing is to make sure that you're piping directly and over um, your tray. So I'm just going to show you, Chloe, how to get them into a piping bag. I've got, this is just a disposable piping bag that I've used, but you can use reusable piping bags just as easily, whatever you sort of prefer. I buy these in rolls of 100. And so mm -hmm. if you're going to be making lots of macarons or doing lots of piping, I would recommend them. They're great. And I've just put a, um, what's known as a seven, um, a size seven round piping tip into it. So it's quite small. Seven is actually 0.7 centimetres, so seven millimetres. Um, and that I find is really the smaller the piping tip gives you more control over how much mixture you put on your tray, but also um, the, you can actually really um, have more control over how large they are. So, and what I've done here is I've just put it into a jug. I folded the top part of the bag over, put it into a jug. Because sometimes when you're on your own in the kitchen, it's kind of hard. I mean, this is almost a job for, for three hands. But if you put it in a jug like that, that keeps it upright for you. Um, and then all you have to do, and hopefully you'll be able to see this, is just pour it in. spoon it in or pour it in. You can see that beautiful molten lava. That's a great tip. Consistency mm. coming out. And so that means you can get it all very neatly into the bag mm. without much fuss, really. Annika, is there any cheats in not having a piping bag? I, it might be hard. Some people, maybe this is their first time baking and they want to, want to plunge yeah. into doing it. On. Is there some other cheat that you can tell us if you don't have a pipe yeah. bag? Yeah, you're not going to get the same sort of shape, but mm. all I would say is use a teaspoon measure so you get the same amount on every macaron. Oh, right. um, mm. Don't worry about your circles because they may actually be a little bit bigger or smaller depending on how much you put in each. But if you use a little teaspoon measure, it will make sure that they're all the same consistency. And then pour from the tip of the spoon if you can. Um, and that will, I, it was a little trick I learned when I was about 10 making pikelets, that if you pour a mixture from the tip of a spoon, you know, from the tip of a spoon, mm -hmm. you're going to get a more rounded size than if you pour it from the, the um, sorry, I'll show you. The side, so yeah. From the tip of the spoon rather than the, side of the spoon you'll get a better um sort of roundness for it so um roundness that's not a very good description is it? you'll so they'll be more they'll be more evenly sized yes perfect so once you've got all that mixture into your party bag so can you see how easy that was just getting that yeah. mixture in love it and it's fallen to the bottom so i've made sure that my piping tip is 
down the bottom of the piping bag and is firmly secure there. I just have to press that mixture down. Keep the jug below you because you can see that that's just coming out a little bit mm -hmm. below it. I mean at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get our tray that we've got our, um, our template on it. I quite often use a little bit of mixture under the template and under the piping bag. I just put a few dobs underneath so that will allow it, sort of stop it from slipping around at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, a bit of extra there on the tray. And then <laughs> what you want to do is hold your piping bag, hopefully you'll be able to see this, perpendicular to, so you put it in the centre of one of those circles. Hold mm -hmm. it perpendicular to your tray. And oh, actually, before we go that, I just want to show you actually also how I'm holding my piping bag. So I have full control. I'm right-handed. Um, so I have full control in the palm of my piping bag. I've clasped my thumb and first finger. I've twisted the end of the piping bag and then clasped my um, fingers around that to stop the mixture flowing back up the other way. Um, but then the, the bag itself is sitting in the, in the um, palm of my hand, which means that I have full control about how much or how, um, how much I squeeze the bag, which will then dictate how much comes out of the pipe and tip. Um, and then I just use my other hand, my left hand, just to guide it a little bit if I need to. I hold the pipe and tip about a centimetre above the tray and then I just gently squeeze. And what I'm doing is I'm squeezing enough just to fill that circle. I'm giving it a little bit of a clockwise or anti-clockwise twist, and that will help break the mixture between the tip and the actual macaron on the tray um, mm -hmm. and allow you to pull it off. Because if you try and sort of pull it off, if you'll end up with a bit of a stream and then you could get a bit of a lopsided macaron. Yeah. So okay. just showing you again, just about a centimetre off the top and enough pressure to fill that circle, a little bit of a twist to break it. And what you'll find is too, these have got a little bit of a point on them, as you can see. Can you see that? that yeah, we can see that. Hard to see. Yeah, yes, you can see that. Yeah. It's a little that's bit of a point. And what you can do if that happens, let them sit for a minute or two or do your whole tray first. Because what you'll probably find is if the mixture's at the right consistency, it will just settle and it will kind of just fix itself basically. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, what you can do is just give your tray a little bit of a tap, three or four taps on the thing and it'll just settle it for you. So, um, and, and that way, that's how you get, you know, really even, um, evenly sized, nicely rounded shaped macarons. Um, but this mixture is actually really good consistency. My mixture this morning was a little bit wet, um, but I'm quite pleased with this one. <laughs> when it counts, right? <laughs> yep, yeah. So, so then we kind of... Move on to, set, you've got to actually set the macarons aside for about, it, it can actually, it depends on the humidity and the weather, but you can set it aside usually for about half an hour and any time up to usually about an hour. But you want okay. to dry the surface out a little bit. Because do, do we have a question around why you have to set the macarons yeah, well, aside? Yeah, maybe if you can delve into that, that would be wonderful. Why do we have to let them stand before piping them and up? Before baking them, sorry, after piping and before baking. Yeah, yeah. So this helps them form that really beautiful crust on the surface and allows them to also be, uh, all those, those feet to be created. So it's kind of got dual purpose. And what you want to do is I did these earlier, just before we came on. So they've been probably sitting here for about an hour now. They were probably ready about half an hour ago because in my house it's relatively warm but it's not humid. So the, the, the warmer the day um, but the drier the atmosphere, the more quickly they will dry out. Um, but if it's quite a humid day, what you'll find is that you'll probably have to set them aside for a lot longer. And I also find putting them under... I quite often put them under, um, you know, in your um, exhaust fan over your stove top. The range. Light. 
if you put yes if you turn your light on that will kind of heat and dry out the kind of immediate atmosphere around it and it helps sort of quicken that process basically but what you want is that you press your finger onto them and your finger doesn't get stuck so uh -huh. say if i um i'll just pipe another one on this tray the with fresh mixture mm -hmm. and what you'll see if i press that one that's been and you can see how much these ones have flattened as i said this mixture was a little bit wetter so mm. i'm I'm feeling the one I've just made won't be as flat, but they'll still bake really well. Um, that it's not getting, there's no mixtures mm. on it. But if I press it on this one, can you see the mixture sticking? Pulling so what it. you want yeah. is the macaron to dry out enough that it doesn't stick to your finger. And the other thing that you'd need to do is decorate them if you're going to decorate them before they dry, because obviously... <laughs> You won't, nothing will stick. It'll and just what I, yeah. So in my recipe um, on, on the Winning Appliances um, website, what I've done is I've just done some beautiful crushed freeze-dried raspberries to mirror the flavour that I've made a, a beautiful fresh raspberry jam that goes inside. But today what I've done is that I have crushed up a few um, dried, edible dried rose petals and just sprinkled those on the top and they make a really beautiful... Yeah, that's um, delicious. Yeah, but you could use... I mean, I've got a few little sprinkles here. These are these are little kind of um, glassy looking. Oh, you can't see them very well. But any sort of sprinkles, you don't want anything that is really heavy because it's going to then flatten the macarons and you don't want that. So you need really light type of uh, decorations. And I always go less is best yeah. when you're decorating. So you want to decorate those, set those aside until they are like that. Um, and then you want to bake them. They'll take about 15 to 18, 18 minutes in your oven um, at 160 conventional or 140 fan forced um, and or, you know, fan assisted. Um, and what you'll end up with are these little macarons. Um, these ones, as I said, the batter was quite wet. And as I said, it can affect the feet and how they develop. But these have just got some a really beautiful, gentle foot to them. I don't know whether you can see, yes, you can see them. I can just see that. You can see can the you separation. See one looks matte and one looks shiny. Is that right? Yeah. So, and it, it, the feet are a little bit bubbly at the bottom. Mm. So what you'll get is this sort of rough texture in the feet and then the rest of the shell will really be smooth and, mm. um, and just, just this beautiful um, sort of consistent uh, texture across it. When they're baked, Chloe, the really important thing is is how you can tell when they're baked is that you can just tap the top of them. So while they're sitting on the tray, you can just use your finger, just open your oven and very quickly just tap the top of the tray and you'll find that the top of the macaron, so not the feet, the feet will stick to your tray, but if the top shifts a bit, um, they're not ready. So you uh -huh. need to, so either tap them or I sometimes just very gently pinch them on either side and give them a little bit of a kind of wobble. And if they mm -hmm. wobble, then they're not ready. So I just put them back in for another minute, check them. And it's really important at the end of baking you check them quite regularly mm -hmm. because if you don't, they can brown quite easily and you can mm -hmm. overbake them. Um, but once they get to that stage, pull them out of the oven, let them cool on your tray. Um, and don't remove them because what can happen, I don't, I think I haven't, I haven't moved these, these are all put on the tray, but what can happen, the base of them can peel off onto your baking paper and you could be left with half your macaron sitting that. on your baking paper. But I've cooled these ones on the baking paper and you can see yeah. that they've come off really beautifully and they've got so a what really should nice beautiful. base to them. Oh, yeah, you can see that. So what should they actually look like when they're ready? Are you saying, because I know you're saying that, the top should move and the bottom shouldn't and that's how they're not done. What should they look like when they are done? Will the base actually be able to be moved? Is that no, you saying? won't be able to move them at all. So no. the base will be stuck to the tray and the top yeah. won't shift at all. And it'll be just the when they're not ready, it's only the tiniest little bit of a shift, okay. but it's, it's noticeable. 
Um, and so it just means that the inside aren't quite set. Mm. Um, and you need to leave them longer because if you take them out at that point, they will stick to your tray once they are dry and you'll mm. end up with great big hollow macarons, basically. Is um, it important, Annika, to let them then set on the tray for a little bit before trying to move them instead of like yeah, when you for the biscuit, yeah. thinking, hey, yeah, I'm so going to quickly eat one? Yeah. You can quickly eat them if you want it because no one's going to see them, so that's fine. <laughs> But if you want some really beautiful looking macarons that aren't hollow inside, I mean, the hollowness is a little bit to do with over whisking egg whites or under whisking them as well. Um, so that can cause that. But certainly, um, definitely cool them on your trays um, mm -hmm. and don't move them until you do. So these ones, um, these ones at the front, I've actually peeled those off already, but the ones at the back, I haven't. But, oh, hold on, this one. Uh, no, hold on. Yes, that one's still stuck, but you can see it comes off really easily. Nice. So there's a little bit of resistance, but not much at all. Yeah. Annika, um, because they are similar to meringue, are you allowed to open and close the door? Like, you know how when we're doing a meringue, we're told not to really be doing the open and close of the door. Um, but you're saying we should be checking on them or they're a little bit more forgiving? Yeah, um, I always check mine at about the 10 minute mark and it depends on your oven most ovens these days bake really evenly um, particularly if you're using a fan assisted or a fan for, for setting that 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 um sort of heat will be evenly distributed through the oven but if you do if you've got hot spots in your oven and you need to turn your tray i usually do that at about the 10 minute mark if i have to um or would recommend you to do that um but you they're they're quite forgiving. I mean, I, like some of the ones I made today, I was opening the door probably five times, but I do always say when, when you are baking something and it doesn't matter whether it's a sponge or um, meringues or something quite um, uh, sort of sensitive to drops in temperature is to have a bit of a game plan. Know what you're doing when you open the oven. Have your oven mitts or your tea towel with you so you can do the checking that you need to do or the moving mm. of the tray. Don't open the oven and go, oh, where's my tea towel? Where's my... <laughs> because that's what that's when you're going to waste time and mm -hmm. the oven's going to cool down a lot. So have a game plan. That's great. Well, you have a beautiful chocolate ganache recipe that you've paired your macarons with. Is there a trick to getting the ganache looking perfect? Is there something we should look for to know that maybe it's not correct? You've got yeah. Any ganache? So, yeah, so the ganache that I've, um, I've given you in this recipe is actually a whipped ganache. So mm -hmm. you, you make a ganache out of heating cream, adding chocolate, um, letting the chocolate melt and then stirring the mixture. The one thing I do say always about ganaches is make sure you give them enough um, stirring and enough um, manipulation. Um, either this one I've used a whisk, but... Because that chocolate and that cream, what you're doing is forming what's known as an emulsion, you mm. need to stir it enough that it comes together in one beautiful um, sort of liquid mass. Mm. And so if you don't do that, then that can cause some problems sort of later on. But then you cool this ganache down until it's quite a thick consistency and then use a whisk just to whisk it until it increases in volume slightly um, and, um, and, and it, it'll go a slightly pale colour. But what I would say is make sure that you... And it'll thicken. The more you whisk it, the more it'll thicken. And what right. you're looking for is that you want to stop it at a point where it's still a really good piping consistency because this one, we're going to again put the ganache into a piping bag and then you're going to pipe a little ring of ganache round the outside of your um, half of your macarons. And then I've made, as I mentioned earlier, um, just a homemade raspberry jam, which is just 100 grams of frozen raspberries, two tablespoons of caster sugar. And you just cook that over a stove top until the raspberries sort of soften and um, collapse. And then the mixture thickens to a jam consistency. And you put a little dollop of that jam in the centre of the ganache and the ganache holds it and because when the ganache will then set so you sandwich the two um, macarons together 
the um, the ganache will set and hold that beautiful soft jam inside. So you get this kind of layers of crispiness and then um, set ganache in this gooey kind of centre of raspberry jam in the centre. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds so good. I wish I had some now. Um, I know. I'll have to send some down to you. Please. Please do. <laughs> Annika, what's the best way to store them? And because, you know, you are saying there is cream in it, do we have to keep them in the fridge if they do last? Yeah, I, I always recommend to keep macarons in the fridge. And it's this funny thing that it helps keep them um, slightly crisp. They're going to go soft a little bit. And that's the beauty about adding something like this raspberry jam centre that has moisture in it. It will soften the inside of your macarons, but then your, your shells will remain crisp. So in an airtight container um, and, and in the fridge, but then I also, because of the ganache and the ganache is always best served at room temperature, I would say let them sit at room temperature for sort of 30 minutes, an hour, depending on your room temperature and your kitchen mm. temperature before you actually serve them because then you'll get the best flavour um, out of the whole little gorgeous package because... When things are chilled, the, the flavour is always dulled. Um, that's why with ice creams, we always have to pump them full of flavour before we freeze them is because that, that chilling or that, um, you know, that lower temperature will dull the flavours a little bit. So they're always best brought back to room temperature. Okay. Perfect. I'll take this last question. And it's how quickly do you have to work with the mixture? before baking and does it break down the longer it remains uncooked yeah no, your... that's that's a really good so what was the second part of that question chloe so how quickly do you have down. to work with the mixture and then yeah yes. does it break down the longer it's sitting there before it's yes it does it split so it is best to use like once you've combined your almond mixture and your meringue it is best to pipe them straight away and Setting them aside and letting them, um, that skin form and for them to become firm before you actually bake them, it doesn't matter if you need to leave them there for an extra 20 minutes or half an hour after that stage. They will still bake beautifully. Um, but if you let your mixture sit for too long and then put it into a piping bag and then you're manipulating it again and you're piping it out, it can actually become quite thin. And so mm. once you've got that consistency right, make really good use of it. Um, mm. It won't separate. You know, if you leave a mixture sitting around for a little while, it won't separate. It'll just thin. So you don't want that to happen. So that, that's the main, you know, thing that can happen if, you are, um, if, if you've got a mixture sitting around for too long. Perfect. I think that's all the questions we have time for today. I want to... Thank everyone. Hopefully we got to you. I think we got to all the questions there. Um, we want to thank you for joining us over the Easter long weekend and especially you, Annika. I know that everyone is loving all the answers you've been giving us and the tips and tricks and your recipes are absolutely beautiful. So if you haven't had a chance to jump onto the Winning Appliances website under the inspiration and recipe section, make sure you check out some other beautiful Easter recipes we have on there. And thank you again, Annika, and I wish you a happy Easter. Thank you for thank joining you, us. <laughs> yeah, to you and your family. And thank, thanks for having me on. It's been fun. It has been. It has been a lot of fun. And make sure everyone, you all stay safe and stay connected because we will be coming up with our more content and questions like this. And we hope you've enjoyed your time with us. Stay safe and happy Easter. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye.